Hi, Spring fans. Welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. Do you have software that you think about rewriting? Software from long ago that you wish you could have had another crack at? I do. I have things that I keep thinking about. And of course, increasingly, all this new software gets introduced. And we have these new options for building better systems. And uh, you can't help but wonder what could have been, you know? And I had a system once that I built with a, with a number of other people, of course, that processed video assets. It did transcoding and audio mixing and all this kind of stuff. And of course, that requires a lot of CPU and, and indeed GPU and, and a lot of compute capacity. And this is uh, on a grid. This is before cloud computing. Don't at me. And so we had a system where we'd pull work down from a workflow engine and uh, and then do the work on individual grid nodes and report back to the workflow engine saying, hey, this job is done, right? And this is work stealing at its finest. I think that pattern has stuck with me. It's a very useful pattern. As you get job, as you, as you have work, as you have tasks, as you have jobs to do, let, let the system eagerly pull it down as fast as it can. The goal is to end up in a situation where the work queue is drained and, and you don't have a lot of extra idle computers as well, right? And so there's a lot of technologies that help you with that to get fair load balancing and distribution of work in the system. Uh, and I, I've talked about a lot of them on this very show, you know, uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow, uh, Spring Integration, Spring Batch and Remote Partitioning and Chunking, you know, RabbitMQ, just in general, or Kafka are ideal for these kinds of architectures. Um, Erlang OTP, obviously, is a, is a kind of thing that kind of gets you there. I mean, lots of things. Tuple spaces. Genie. I don't know if any of you remember Genie, but that was a tuple space uh, implementation. Uh, and there was a great, you know, actual implementation called Java Spaces that people could use. That was really quite good. Lots of technologies that serve this use case. And I can't help but wonder what would I have done? Well, I had that same thought yet again recently because I've been playing with Job Runner. Now I've used Job Runner before and I've even talked about it, I think, but not in a full dedicated video. It's a job scheduling engine. It's sort of like Quartz, which is a job scheduling engine that is the enterprise Java friendly version of Cron basically, or Autosys or BMC or whatever. It's a very, very useful, scalable system. And, and, I've used that before. Heck, I even wrote the uh, native AOT support for it in the Spring Native project. So I like Quartz, but I was wondering about Job Runner. I really wanted to explore that. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna do today, my friends. We're gonna look at Job Runner, which is a fantastic open source project uh, designed by Ronald de Heysera out of Belgium. Uh, and it's, it's a burgeoning project. It's got a lot of huge customers and users, new features all the time. I'm a big fan. And today we're gonna talk about that and its use cases uh, and its really amazing Spring support. Let's do so, as always, by going to my second favorite place on the internet, start.spring.io. I'm gonna build a new application. Logically, I'm gonna have two parts, a leader node and a worker node. Now you could, in, in if you wanted to, you could bundle all these things in one JVM, but again, the whole point is to farm work out across the cluster. So I'm gonna show you one leader, one worker node. And there's gonna be some common shared code between them. So I'll actually have three modules in play during our demo today. We're gonna to use Maven. I'm gonna call this the leader node. We use Java 21. We'll add that, I'm gonna add the actuator support. I'll generate those other modules as well. All right, let's open these up. So there's the three zip files. So for i in zip, do unzip i done, okay? There we are, rm zip. I'm gonna open up this project here in my IDE so that we have all the Maven projects under one IDE, so it's easy to keep track of what's happening. And IntelliJ will let me load them all in the same context. Now I'm also gonna use Docker Compose to run a Postgres database. So I'll ask the Spring Initializer to generate a compose.yaml, and I'll just put that here in the root directory, sort of in a common ancestral directory. Paste that. We're gonna use the port 5432. I'm gonna expose it publicly. All right, now let's run this, okay? Looks like it's up and running. Very good. Now. We have our code, we have the application. Let's actually start integrating a job writer in. And that's an easy enough dependency to add. We'll go to our palm.xmls for the three different projects and add it here in the dependencies. Okay, there's the dependency. Let's go ahead and copy that to the leader node here and to the shared node. Okay, so let's re-import command shift I, command shift I, and command shift I. Now that's on all three different modules. The shared one is gonna be a jar, not actually a Spring Boot app. I'm gonna get rid of the plugin so that I don't get a so-called fat jar, I just want a regular jar that I can then consume from my other modules. Speaking of which, let's do that now. There it is on the leader node. Now, what about the worker node? There it is there as well. 
Okay, so now we've got our build set up. Let's actually start looking at the code. Remember, we're going to start our job runner application by talking to a database, which is running in the Docker container behind the scenes. So we'll plug in the Spring Data Source credentials. Username is my user, password equals secret. And then the URL is jvc colon postgresql localhost my database. All right, I'm going to copy and paste that into the leader as well. Here we are. Et voila. Now we have our leader application and our two configuration files. They should both be able to talk to the same SQL database. Uh, and about that, actually, I want to talk to the same SQL database as well. So let's go to the leader and have IntelliJ create a new database connection here for me. Very good. There's nothing in there just yet, but uh, we can start up the application. Just We'll just start up, not having done anything of note yet. Run the application and refresh this. And now you can see that JobRunner has already taken the initiative and installed some metadata tables required to track the uh, state of the various jobs in the cluster. And it's even got this nice convenient view, which tells you how many jobs you've got, how many have succeeded, how many were deleted, how many are failed, how many are processing, how many are queued and scheduled and, and so on. We're off to the races. We've got a good first step, but let's actually do something. So I'm gonna create an application uh, that has a, just a, a application runner, right? New application runner. And I'm gonna, you know, I could use the static method here. This is, you might see this a lot in the documentation. Just do that, hello world. And, and that works actually, right? That's actually trivial enough to do the job. Behind the scenes, that's actually gonna take that Lambda. The Lambda itself, by the way, don't, don't give it an implementation of the interface. It needs a Lambda. It does some sorcery with the uh, ASM and it serializes that, that Lambda over the wire. So it's very, very interesting, but it works. It'll, it'll actually uh, distribute that work with the Lambda over the cluster, okay? So let's, uh, let's go ahead and try it, actually. Let's just run this application as is, first steps with job runner. We're gonna run the application. We won't see this output on this node. Let's go ahead and try it. The worker node has spun up. Now let's spin up this leader node and watch the worker node. Oh, we got port conflicts, of course. So on the leader node, port 8081 on the leader node. This is the leader node. Let's go ahead and run this. Okay, so the application is started up, but there's no output in the console. We want this to be run, after all, on other nodes in the cluster. So I'm going to go to the worker application, and I'm going to go to the configuration for the worker application, and I'll configure it to be a background job server. So I'll enable background jobs on the worker node. Also, I'm going to run this on a separate port just because I want, you know, I want to know, I want these things to not conflict with each other, the leader and the worker node, okay? So here's the configuration for the worker application. Let's just, I haven't made any changes. I've just enabled the background server support. Start it, and there you go. You can see I've got a few of these queued up already because I ran it twice, I think, uh, and we get the result, okay? So now if I run the, if I rerun the leader node one more time, leaving the worker node as is, go back to the worker node. I accidentally restarted the uh, worker node, didn't I? Okay, so we've, we've managed to start the leader and we started the worker and we can see the results are as we expected. Okay, very simple, very good. Now, this is, Behind the scenes, this background job is actually using something called a job scheduler, okay? So you can actually just inject that if you like. And I prefer to do that. It's actually more idiomatic for me to do that, okay? From job scheduler, okay? So I'm gonna start up the worker node, okay? And then I'll restart the leader node, okay? And the leader node will, of course, send that work across the cluster. And we can see, hello world, first step of the job from the job scheduler. Okay, same result, good stuff. But there's a, a few other methods here, obviously. In queue, just tells the system to run the thing immediately, somewhere, anywhere, as fast as you can, right? You can also schedule something recurrently. You can actually pass in like a, like in, you can say I wanna to run it in an interval, uh, you know, of a certain duration away from now, right? Uh, uh, you can also pass in of various cron expressions and things like that. You can do all sorts of really interesting things with just this low-level API. That said, you aren't just passing lambdas around, right? There's no context really there except for what's whatever's in scope. And, you know, I, I don't know if I trust all that. I want an object. I want to be able to, like, pack up and parcel away the things I want to be done. And you can do that with a job request. So let's use a job request scheduler. And this is where we're going to have our shared module. We'll go to our shared module here, get rid of the tests, and in the shared code, we're going to create a new package called shared, and we'll create a job request type. I'm gonna call it my job request. You can call it whatever you like. It has to implement job request, which is the type from job runner, 
Okay, and the the job of this interface is to tell Job Runner what callback to run once the request has arrived. So this is going to be serialized. It's going to arrive on the worker node, and the worker node is going to say, "Okay, I've got this payload, but which handler should be assigned to it?" Well, it's going to look for a bean based on the class that you give it here. So we need to provide a bean of type job request handler. I'm going to call it my job request handler. Okay, implement job request handler for my job request. There's that, and you're supposed to implement the run method. So there we go, there's our job request handler. We need to tell our job request about it, All right? And you can actually downcast to that if you like. Very good, so now we have our job request, and job request is gonna be serialized. It's gonna be serialized using JSON, right? And you can pack in uh, extra metadata there. For example, I could say a uh, name, okay? I can pass in a name, and I can say this is a JSON creator, and JSON property is name, okay? So now that's gonna be serialized, I'm gonna pass in the name, and then my, my handler here, I have a pointer to that. I can say, hello, my job request dot, and I need a, I need the name as well. So getter, get name. I tend to be, there you go, I like that style. Okay, so get name, there you go. All right, pretty straightforward. So we, we, need, we need to actually have a bean of this type in the worker node, but not in the leader node, okay? So in the worker node, well, first of all, we have to go over here, go to our Java config for the worker node and register a bean of that type. I might need to install it in the local Maven repository. There it is. Okay, so now we have the, the work here. Springs, the job runner auto configuration will automatically look for the new work and it'll see that the message comes in and it has this handler class assigned to it. It'll automatically invoke, it'll find this bean and then invoke it and have it pro process the incoming message. On the leader side, we need to actually send the request. So I'm gonna restart the worker first, okay? And then in the leader side, I'm gonna rewrite the code to use the job request scheduler. So here I'll say job request scheduler dot in queue, new my job request, passing in spring of ads as the name, okay? And we don't need this anymore. Get rid of that, convenient. Let's now rerun the leader with the new uh, orders being sent out to the workers. Okay, the leader has started its run Okay, now we go to, back to the worker, and there you go. Hello, Spring fans. Not bad, huh? Now we're able to pack up whatever information you want. And you can imagine, for example, packing up the name of a job, a Spring Batch job, and then passing in the parameters in that re job request. Then you could use that to launch a Spring Batch job on whatever node is available, right? Just spin up all these worker nodes, as many instances as you like, and it'll automatically pull down as much work as, as it needs to through this, through this database substrate and so on. We saw that there's a SQL table, but what if something goes wrong? What happens there? Well, let's suppose I have something that fails. Okay, so let's go back to my job request handler and I'm gonna throw an exception. So I'll throw new runtime exception. Whoops, couldn't process the request, right? Well, by default, there's gonna be a retry handler that gets involved that you know attempts to retry the work. And by default, I think it retries it 10 times. Well, I don't want it to retry 10 times, maybe three times, let's say, okay? So I'm gonna configure a property here on the worker node saying, I wanna retry failing failing jobs on, a, on the worker node a maximum of three times. And what is the retry policy? Well, there's a back off time C that you can specify, and there's even a retry policy Java object that you can configure uh, that contributes to that. But either way, I'm just gonna limit it to that. Let's just see what happens, okay? So I've reworked both, I've reworked the, uh, the handler. So let's go ahead and shut down the leader and shut down the worker. And then I'll restart the worker, okay? Nothing in there. Now let's restart the leader. It's gonna send a job, which is of course going to fail. So let's go ahead and run that. You can see the stack trace on the background. Whoops, there, it ran once already, okay? So I print it out. Let's just wait for it a little bit. It has a progressively longer wait between runs too. That's kind of interesting. It's got a back off policy, so you don't get a stampeding horde Kind of problem. There's a second run. And remember, it's three retries. So it'll do the first attempt plus three subsequent re retries. So you might see the same output four different times at progressively longer intervals, which gets us to another point, friends. You need to design your code in such a way that it's idempotent. That is to say, you can rerun the same job over and over and over without any undue side effects. This is critical in any kind of distributed systems design, but especially here, right? These jobs 
need to be able to be rerun or at least reset themselves cleanly every single time because they might get rerun multiple times. All right, so there, there's the uh, that should be the final run. And now if we go to the SQL table here and look at the view, you can see we have one failed job, four succeeded, all time succeeded, blah, 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 number of background jobs, number of threads, etc. Total number is five. Good. So we're making progress. We have a, this table telling us what's happening. And you can see it's doing the right thing with, re, with respect to retry. We're able to guarantee that the work gets done as soon as possible. Um, but sometimes you really want to see, don't you? You want to be able to act on that. I don't want to have to run a query just to know if something's wrong, right? And here again, JobRunner is no slouch. It provides a lot of really amazing support. So on the leader node, or any node really, but I'm going to use the leader node, we're going to configure the actuator support, okay? So we're going to say show health details always. We're going to expose all the endpoints. We're going to use the job runner metrics allowed is true. Okay. So now I'm going to restart the leader node. This will run on port 880. 8080. Go here, localhost, forward slash actuator. Okay. Same as you've always seen before, right? Nothing particularly special here. But first of all, there's a job runner representation in the health endpoint, very nice. Uh, but more importantly, there's also support here in the metrics. So you can look at, for example, how many failed jobs you've got by looking at job runner jobs.failed, right? So there's that, go here, and voila. And the nice thing is, that, remember, our metric support is powered by Micrometer. Micrometer is a, an open source project uh, with lots of different integrations for different time series databases. You can use it to forward these metrics to your telemetry system in, in time series database of choice, be it Prometheus or Netflix Atlas or Grafana or Datadog or Dynatrace or whatever, right? You can also do distributed logs, right? You can actually use Spring Cloud Sleuth uh, in this context as well. So there's lots of interesting ways to observe what's happening. But here too, it's very much a do-it-yourself kind of system, isn't it? You have to build the system out yourself. You have to build a dashboard based on these metrics and all that, unless you don't. Thankfully, Job Runner also comes with a dashboard. That's right. So we're going to go back to the leader and enable the Job Runner dashboard. I'm going to rerun the leader, and that'll start on port 8000. It's up and running. Let's go ahead and check this out. Localhost 8000. And now you can see we have a lot of the same information as we had before. The dashboard shows you, you know, it's, it's still doing some computations here. Uptime is four minutes. CPU load, jobs. Okay. You can see. We have two failed jobs one minute, three minutes ago. How many have succeeded? How many are processing? How many have been queued? How many have been deleted? Uh, how many have been scheduled? So remember, you can actually schedule work to run like a minute from now or 30 seconds from now or something like that, or on a recurring basis. You can say schedule recurrently and that'll show up here and you'll say, it'll say, oh, it's scheduled to run in, a, in an hour and then two weeks or whatever. Lots of opportunities here, friend. All right. What do you think, friend? Was that Pretty, pretty amazing, pretty powerful, pretty capable. And of course, this pairs nicely with things like Graal VM and virtual threads as well. That gives you even more scalability and more distribution and more efficiency. So now you, it's guilt-free to spin up as many worker nodes as you need to handle the capacity. You've got a nice messaging topology here. Obviously, this pairs nicely with something like Cloud Foundry as well, right? Uh, or Kubernetes. You can use that to spin up more capacity to then pull down the work and do the work. I love uh, projects like this that make something very difficult, which is, uh, you know, distributed systems, for example, as easy and elegant as possible. And we've only shown you the stuff that's in the open source project. There is a pro uh, professional commercial edition that has a, a number of other features that go above and beyond what we've shown here as well. And so I encourage you, if you have a, such a need and you want those extra niceties, and they are really pretty tantalizing, maybe go check out jobrunner.io and look at those features and see if that's worth it for you. I think it might be. I am a big fan of this project. I hope you'll check it out. I hope you got something out of it. And as always, my friends, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.